you haven't already, uh, please copy over the lecture. Um, it's uh, it's pretty complete today, so um, there'll be there'll be less typing for you. But uh, you know, there it is. Um, so quickly, uh, we don't have a lot of announcements. I guess I have one, but uh, so that talk I did get permission for anybody who wants to come. Like I said, it's not really about data science; it's more about Linux. Um, but if you're interested, there it is. Uh, however, oddly enough, even though it's not really about data science, and I'm teaching data science classes. The group that asked me to give the talk on not data science is the data science club. So, you know, who knows? Um, so you might want to uh, join the data science club and that would be another reason to come to the uh, event. So that's the first thing. Second thing, we're going to try to have uh, midterm results out by Monday uh, at the same or, or class like by next week. Um, or, and at the same time, we're also going to try to give you a sense of your current like grade in the class. Um, you know, there'll be some caveats, right? We don't really have participation and stuff in there, right? Because that doesn't, that kind of takes place over the course of the semester. Um, but it'll, you know, give you an idea of kind of how you're doing. Um, and, you know, maybe we can figure out some suggestions if you are unhappy with how you're doing. Um, any questions? All right. So today we're going to be kind of talking about models, but before that, uh, I wanted to point out a couple of things that I didn't, I think I didn't really cover when I talked about statistics. Um, so a statistic is an estimate of an unknown parameter. Uh, you flip a coin n times, you count the number of h heads, right? So, sorry, I, sorry that's why it's talent size. So you flip a coin n times um, and count the number of h of heads. I guess there's a grammar problem there, I don't know what it is, in those n flips. Uh, estimate of coin bias B is the statistic B with a little hat. Okay. Um, so, what I want to point out is some of the conventions, which is um, H. Okay. So, first and foremost, I actually say it down here, but um, generally speaking, when you're talking about mathematical expressions, variables are italicized to make it clear that they're an unknown. Um, and, you know, and then real numbers or like symbols or whatever are not. Uh, in case you were not aware of that. Um, each is random. So in other words, like, uh, you know, we don't know when we're flipping all those coins, we flip the coins n times. So that's the number we know, but the H is how many times we get heads, right? So it's going to be random and it'll be different if we do different runs, right, of the same thing. Um, so that's why H is capital and N is lower, okay? Um, and then because each is random, and B is calculated from a random, that means it gets capitalized. But as I was jokingly referring to it, but it wears a little hat to show, to hide the fact that it's not a real thing, it's a calculation, okay? So just remember he's wearing a little hat because he's not a real number. Um, and also called a circumflex, if you wanna know what the real word is for it. Um, and very hard to type on a computer, in fact. Uh, B and N are deterministic, and so therefore lowercase, uh, and I think that's it. Uh, the rest of you know. All right. So just kind of keep in mind that those conventions give you hints about what you know the thing is, and that'll make it a little simpler uh, to be able to understand it. Then let's see. I think we go to more slides. Sorry, I'm fixing my window here. Um, all right. And then we talked a little bit about distributions last time, uh, and maybe the time before. So any random quantity has a probability distribution. So every, you know, if you're if you're calculating something or like or you know testing something or whatever, like it has a probability. The question is, can you figure it out in a reasonable amount of time? You know, before the heat death of the universe, right? Um, so, and we actually use lots of tricks actually that are based on that problem. So like most encryption is based on the fact that you can't calculate certain things, right, in a certain amount of time. Um, so with repeated draws, you get an empirical distribution. So we're talking about the heads and tails example a little bit here, but we can observe how many times does it, um, and then the proportion of times is uh, it took to get each out. So, um, you know, so what we're trying to do a lot of the time is we're trying to do something like this to approximate that, right? And then, um, 
Yeah, so, and given the law of large numbers, right, the more you do it, the more likely it is to be similar to the real one, okay? So obviously figuring out how many to do to get close, but not spending too much resources to get there is uh, part of the problem. So we're gonna talk about that some more. All right, um, I'm trying to remember when we switched to the uh, notebook. Yeah, first we're gonna talk about, I think we're gonna talk about models a little bit. So a model is a set of assumptions about the data um, and many models involve assumptions that involve processes involve randomness um, and sometimes referred to as chance models. Um, so we've talked about those a bit um, and kind of the varying levels of randomness involved. Uh, and basically what do we wanna know? We wanna know if the model fits the data. So the definition or the term that we use for this activity, right, is creating a model. All right, so what do we wanna do is we want to try to figure out if we can assess how that model works um, or how, how good it does at predicting uh, what we want. So the best way to do that is actually, you know, to kind of, it's funny, there's the terminology has started to build up, but training a model, you may have heard that term before, uh, particularly in machine learning. So basically you kind of, make your model, whatever that means, right? Uh, when you're talking about machine learning, it's literally a training activity. But in general, you're just kind of making a model and then you use the model to try to compare its predictions to the actual data, right? To try to figure out how it did. So I was supposed to go to the notebook earlier, but we'll go now. So let me just do the needful here. Um, all right, so going back to the United example, um, what we do is uh, we're first just going to set up the table, which should take. So I actually did a bigger uh, horsepower Jupyter notebook today uh, because I knew some of this data was big, and I swear every single thing has been slower today. Don't know why. It's really annoying. Um, I did count it though. Yeah, it seems it seems to have gotten worse. There's too many people doing like real work or something for me to do my demos. Um, all right, there it goes. Uh, so what we want to do is kind of look at the distribution. We're still talking about delay here, right? So we look at the distribution and this is like the actual probability, right? Because we're actually taking that data and doing probability, you know, like we're doing the math, right? Um, and so while this is a big data set, it's not that big, right? Like, I don't actually, I should go look. I don't know actually how, how much time this is for the United Airlines flights. Um, but, you know, going by the blue bikes thing that we talked about last time, you know, two weeks of data was something like 200,000 rows, right? So um, it gets really big, really fast. So that's where you want to not try to do it this way. But so then we can simplify it, right? So we can take a sample. Um, and then we can see how does that sample kind of do against the probability. And it's nice because we can do the real probability, but as you can tell, it's not great, right? When we take two small samples. So we take a 10 and we say, all right, you know, not great. Um, so let's take a look at, I think that's a thousand. Yeah, at a thousand and see how that does uh, by comparison. Um, So does anybody remember how we get to um, the, uh, basically the average for the delay across this whole table? You might wanna help me type it out. All right, I'll give you a hint, it starts with NP. And how do I get the average? What's the other word for average? Uh, sorry, I did not mean average. How do I get the median for the uh, data set? See, they shouldn't have all those M words. All right, it's median. Um, and then we take the table and we take the column we want and hopefully our friends are right. And then we get to the median. And the reason we're looking at this, right, is so that we can say, hey, how does this do compared to our models? 
So we can do the median against uh, our first one with 10, um, and then our second one with like, let's say a thousand, um, and hopefully it's gonna start to get closer. So obviously there's some randomness in here, so it's gonna vary a bit, um, but you know, you're trying to get hints about what's going on. Um, it'll also tell you that, you know, this is another way to figure out like uh, kind of the skew of your data set, right? Is to look at the median versus the mean, right? If they're really close to each other, it means you kind of have a uniform distribution across that thing. But if they're skewed like this one is, they're gonna be different, right? And when I say skewed, I mean, see how it's kind of mostly over here versus, you know, a nice like bell shape, right? All right, so if we want to sample the median size so that we can start to try to figure out um, maybe through repetition, what do we want for a median? Then we can write a little function uh, so we don't have to do it each time. Uh, where instead of doing basically this, I can do it for an arbitrary size by doing, oops. All right, so now I have a nice little function and I can run and get the same thing that I did before. Oh, I don't know what the, why is that not printing anything? Oh, I forgot return. All right, and so what's gonna happen if I run this statement again? Am I going to get the same number or am I going to get a different number? Anybody? Yeah. Right. Likely we'll get a different number because we're taking a different sample, right? And especially because we're pulling only 10 of them, right? So the likelihood out of the, I think it's like 30,000 rows, right? That we get the same 10 is very, very small, right? It's, you know, 10 over 30,000. So we're going to get it all over the place. So what we can do instead, oh, so what we can do to kind of evaluate whether or not that 10 is a good choice is we can kind of do this, but a whole bunch of times math or uh, programmatically, and then look at the results, right? So we're going to just set the num number of times we're going to do the simulation um, to 2000. And so if you notice here, what we're going to do is we're going to first make an array that we're going to put the results in basically. Um, and then we're going to go from I, so basically from zero to the number of simulations. Uh, and then we're going to grab those medians that we create by calling the function. Um, right? Yeah. So, oh, I thought I had edited this. So I always like to show what we get. Um, so sample medians. Right, and so as you can imagine, right, we're going to get a whole bunch of numbers here, um, you know, about two thousand of them, and they're going to kind of be all over the place uh, because our sample size is so small. But we can look at that directly by looking at those medians, right? Um, and so if they're kind of all over the place like this, right, that's not great, right? We kind of want we want this to be pretty tight. Does that make sense? Just make sure I'm in the right place here. All right, so, you know, and so as a result, this is probably not a great example. Um, so what we might wanna do is we kind of go up in scale Right, and so what we do is instead of take oh boy, instead of taking that ten, now we're going to do a thousand, but we're going to do the same uh, two thousand iterations of it. So we're going to end up with that's actually going to take a second, because it's a whole lot of work, right? Because it's got to pull a thousand samples from the uh, the table um, two thousand times, right? So that's going to take a minute, um, although it's already done. 
Uh, and I'm going to do it again just because I don't have, you know, enough free time or something. Um, just so we can see what the output looks like. Oh, but it's a table. No. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Thank you. This is why they call it pair programming. Have you ever heard of pair programming? It's where you have one person who's typing and you have somebody else who's sitting next to them making kind of suggestions. Um, and it's, I swear, primarily catches like syntax errors and sometimes really dumb choices that you make. Um, it is pretty uncommon, but it is an interesting concept. Uh, all right, so then we can make a histogram with that. That still doesn't look great, but um, uh, yeah. I don't know. I'm still kind of going there. Yeah. So, um, but it's kind of around the right medium, right? So, um, <laughs> apparently, my example is kind of yucky today. Uh, but you know, there it is. Let me see if I've got a. So, yeah, no, that's about right. So, still, still not awesome um, to try to get uh, to an understanding of what's kind of going on. So, instead, what we can do is we can, well, not really instead, but like another way of kind of approaching this is we can kind of do a bunch of different examples kind of all at once so that we can kind of compare them to each other to see how they're doing. So, so what this is doing obviously is, you know, it's doing the 10 and then it's doing the 100, and then it's doing a thousand. Um, and so that's actually already done. Um, but then we're not gonna try to display that necessarily, but we can look at the table output just because it'll be simpler. Um, and then we can kind of start to evaluate where do we wanna like make bins and that kind of thing so that we can, try to overlay the different distributions on top of each other so that we can see what it looks like. Uh, so the first thing we do, right, is we grab the minimum out of the each of the columns um, and we see it's five, negative one and one. And then we grab the maximums. All right, and so the maximums are 41 and a half, 10 and four. Okay, so, you know, as you might expect, right? I mean, I'm, this is a little bit of a, a loaded example. But um, you know the thousand seems to be getting to be a pretty good approximation, right? Um, so one of the things I point out here is okay. So what I was trying to do is figure out bin sizes. Does anybody know why I said cheating for legibility there? Does anybody notice like an apparent mistake? So if you notice, this number is quite a bit lower than this number here, right? But the reason I did it is so that you can get a nice pretty graph. Um, you could use, you know, 45 or something, um, but it would be really small and so it's hard to read. Um, and you can see the anomalies out here are really low. Um, and so, you know, because I, when I ran it the first time, you know, you could kind of barely see it on the screen. And the stuff out here, you know, whatever for this case is the example. But the point being is that, you know, what it really should be is bins that are going uh, all the way out to the maximum, right? And all the way to the minimum. So, uh, so what we see here, right, is that we're getting really good median stuff around here, right? Uh, in particular, in the blue, which is the size of the cloud. So, this is a way we can kind of compare our different models to see which one is doing the best, okay? Does that make sense to everybody? So again, we're talking about this a little bit now, right? As kind of like essentially using like gut feel to kind of compare the models, but we're also gonna talk about mathematical ways to, talk, to compare the models. Um, <clears throat> a lot of the time in my experience, right? It's the, um, you kind of take the gut feel approach until you get close and then you start using math um, because you know your first guesses are often wildly inaccurate right and they're easy to tell when it's just plain wrong right um, but as you get closer 
and you want to get better at it, you start using the math to look at better answers. All right, time for a little bit of a story. So, um, first and foremost, uh, and I was looking this up earlier. Um, so the US Constitution uh, says not quite what I thought it did. Um, so I thought it was actually in the Constitution that you will have a jury of your peers, but it must have been in case law later because uh, I actually asked my wife to look it up and uh, it does not actually say that in the Constitution. So, but it does have a bunch of rules around how jury selection is done. So what you might ask is, what's a jury? Well, so a jury, uh, the way the court system works in the US is that you are actually found guilty or not guilty based on a group of what are referred to as laymen, right? So just random people theoretically off the street um, who listen to the case from both the prosecution side and the defense side, and then make a decision about whether or not they think they, uh, what's referred to as the plaintiff, uh, or sorry, the defendant is guilty. Um, and then the basically, and the judge is there to make sure everything is kind of done above board um, and then kind of enforce that decision by the jury. So, however, to get a jury, um, and if you, has anybody ever read 12 Angry Men? All right, so one of the things I think is really funny, especially in American education system, is you're always taught over and over again that there's 12 jurors on a jury. Um, that's not always true. Different juries have different sizes. Um, but long story short, to get those 12, they actually call what's called the jury panel of some number. Uh, uh, this example, I think, uses 100. Um, and that's, I would say, it's pretty typical. Um, but then what happens is you basically get someone for jury duty, you show up, you're one of the 100, and then you're there for the day and available to potentially be on a jury. And you first will be randomly selected to be on a jury for a particular case. And then once you're like kind of in the room, then the lawyers can actually interview you and decide whether or not they want to keep you on the jury. Um, and in theory, there's certain rules about what kinds of things they can't put you on the jury or they can, can reject you from the jury for um, things like race, uh, things like uh, income, you know, all this stuff. Uh, but as people are people, eh, um, so the particular case, and sorry for the long backstory, but I know some people aren't familiar with how juries work, particularly in the US. Um, so here's the backstory. So in 1965, in Talladega, or Talladega County in Alabama, Alabama, oh my goodness, Alabama, uh, there was a guy named Robert Swain who was, um, you know, thought to have committed a crime, uh, and then he was convicted of that crime, uh, and he wanted to appeal the fact that he was convicted of that crime because the constitution of the jury was not uh, representative of the population of the area in which it takes place. So like I said before, it depends on the state and stuff like that in the US, but um, usually it's the population makeup of the county, not like a city or whatever, because counties are usually bigger than cities. Um, so they, you know, file a lawsuit to appeal this. Um, and interestingly enough, right, in 1965, only men who were 21 or older uh, were allowed to participate in juries at this time. Um, however, in Talladega County, 26% of that population was black, okay? Um, and Swain's jury panel, so the group before the actual jury, in a sense, consisted of 100 men, eight of which were black. So that doesn't sound like 26%, right? Because it's a nice, easy number. It should be 26, right? Or thereabouts. So in the appeal, the argument was that um, the 26%, because it wasn't representative, therefore, oh, and actually, and as a sidebar, his actual jury also had, uh, was 100% men, white men. Um, and so it got fought on appeal. It went all the way to the Supreme Court who came back and said um, that the difference between those two numbers is not sufficient to declare essentially a mistrial or, or take the appeal. Um, and so the 
what if, you know, kind of we were asked, is that true, right? So in other words, uh, there's a, a concept in, in, uh, in trials of an expert testimony. Um, and so what happens is basically you have a witness who's an expert in something, let's say data science, who might be called as a witness and asked a question like, is 8% versus 26% a big enough difference to, to matter? Um, and so they said it wasn't. Um, however, you know, at least for me, right, the gut feel is pretty obviously, yeah, that's probably wrong. Um, but because what the, the, the side effect is, right, it means that the jury panel selection is biased, right? And so admitting that the jury panel selection is biased is dangerous. Um, probably a good thing. It's still dangerous. So the Supreme Court was kind of backing off from that. Good, bad, or indifferent, probably bad. Um, but this is what happens, right? So what we can do though is we can actually try to figure out if the 26 versus the eight is okay or not. Um so, but we're gonna need to introduce a new thing called uh, a function called sample proportions, which is part of the data science library, um, where we're going to give uh, the sample size and then how the the population is distributed. Excuse me. Um, and so in this case, uh, so the first thing is the you know basically a straight number, right? And the second thing is an array of percentages, basically, of the population. So in this case, right, we would have a sample size of uh, of um, 100 and the population distribution of um, whatever we call it, uh, 26 and 74. Um, and the samples that random from the population and returns an array containing the distrib distribution of the categories in the sample. And that's a lot of words. So I think it's easier if I show you a picture. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make an array, um, and then we're going to put some data in it, right? So, oh, look at that. Yeah, I was uh, thinking earlier today that uh, maybe I should be running these things locally on my computer um, for problems such as this, but we will see uh, where is. So has anybody ever heard, uh, let's, let's start easy. Has anybody ever heard of the term in technology called the cloud? All right, raise your hands, come on, wake up. Y'all are like hardly here. All right, so one of the things that people often say about the cloud is that the resources are unlimited, right? Have you ever heard this kind of concept before? All right, however, they're not, right? Because what happens is to make it feel like it's unlimited, is that uh, all of the services that are out there are over allocated. Okay, so have you ever gotten on a plane and uh, at least been threatened to be bumped, if not actually bumped, because the plane flight was over allocated? Um, that's actually a whole special branch of math called yield management, which is very interesting. But point is, this sometimes happens, which is that, or my suspicion is, I obviously have no idea, but that the on demand environment there is over allocated. Because at any given time, let's say all of you students started a Jupyter Notebook today, not all of you are actively using that CPU at any given second, right? So that means you can say, you can guess, right, how many like cycles on that CPU um, you can share amongst how many thousands, five, you know, whatever people, uh, such that the experience of the end user is unlimited resources. But in fact, what's going on is that sometimes, Everybody's trying to do it at once. And then you end up with problems like this. Um, and so this might really take our uh, demo today. Because that is not moving. So at the risk of making everything worse, because you know that's the more fun way to do things, um, I'm going to see if I can start a new instance.
because this one is tanked. So to all of you, please be patient as your job sits in our queue. Totally done. Yeah, it's not, oh wait, it finally came back. Of course, just as the other notebook started or server started. Uh, Where it's still cooking. There we go. Close. Close. All right. Okay. Might be back in action. Otherwise, I can switch to the new one if need to. Um <laughs> oh no, I'm destroying it. Never mind. It's my fault. It's because I have a typo. Um, this array here is empty because I was going to ask y'all what it's doing. Uh, and so when I pass it here, it's trying to pull infinite populations out of this. And instead of doing something nice, it's crashing. It's my theory. So let's not break it anymore. But I got to have a fun little sidebar with cloud computing. Um, okay, so I mentioned this a minute ago. Um, does anybody know what these two values should be to be able to talk about the population distribution? And remember I said that the uh, percentage of black people in Talladega County in 1965 uh, was 26. So what should I put for numbers in there? Somebody's got to know. Yeah. Correct. Um, okay, so now we have a population distribution that is not infinite. Um, and so therefore we will get, oh, now I have to run everything above this. Oh, I probably could have. Yeah, so I don't actually use the data. Yeah. Right. Too late. Dumb dummy. Yeah, it's going to take a minute. All right, let me pop open the other one. Actually, let's pull this back over here. All right, so we should be able to go over here. Yes, all right, cool. Sorry for the temp temporary technical difficulties. Um, all right, so then we can pull a sample out of this population. Um, and, you know, so that, that's what we get, right? Um, and so moving on, oh my goodness. Right, so we can now pull samples out of that population and then um, and basically pull the first one off the top, okay? And then so we should get that example. Um, and so, so do you understand what's happening here? Because what's happening, right, is it's trying to say, um, if I pull at random, so the way I, I heard it described was like, you know, imagine a big barrel full of, uh, you know, ping pong balls. Some of them are colored white and some are colored black. And you reach in there and there's a hundred of them in there and I pull out a sample of them. Okay. Will I get 
26% and 74%, okay? Um, or what's the percent I get when I pull them at random? Um, and so I end up with, and then I count, you know, the ones I pulled out and that's my percentage. And because it's easy, um, you know, so if I pull out 27 black ones, then I have, um, you know, 27% or 28% or whatever, um, because the hundred that went in were unknown, right? So you, so you should be seeing, oh, I don't have a typo. So you should be seeing this change to be right around that 26%, right? So then what we need to do is we need to do it a whole bunch of times so that we can get a distribution of where that's happening. Like where are they mostly landing, okay? So, we do that by running an arrange of you know a thousand times and then pulling that sample set a thousand times um, and then finding out what you know what percentage of them which went which way um, and so then we can see a distribution right and so as you can see here I just can't remember what the next slide is um, yeah so as you can see here right. Here's your 8%, right? Which is what the panel actually had. And here's the, you know, our 26%. So in other words, if you go grab the whatever 50,000, I'm just gonna make up a number, right? The 50,000 people live in Talladega County um, and you take a hundred of them at random, okay? You will most of the time have 26 black people in that set, okay? And you have some variation, but like, do you, do you, like, you, at least for this, right? You never vary the eight percent, so it is clearly wildly wrong to say that they're the same. Does that make sense to everybody? It's I, I find that uh, function very hard to explain, um, even though I know what it does. Uh, so hopefully that made sense. But basically, you're trying to you know out of a random group of fifty thousand or whatever, you're pulling out a bunch and looking to see what the ratio is that you end up. Um, I don't know why you really want to keep doing that. Oh, it's because the other window. Yeah. Okay. So to kind of give another example of how we might go about this um, and going at the speed we're going, we might be ending a little early, so hopefully you'll have more questions. Um, So we can kind of talk about another example, um, but you know, long story short, uh, you know, that Supreme Court case was uh, interesting. Um, I feel like it's been reversed since then, um, but I didn't have a chance to go look up documentation about it. All right, anybody heard of uh, Gregor Mendel? All right, anybody know what he's famous for? He's often considered like the founder of genetics. Um, and so what he basically, and I think this, this is hard to explain in terms where like, you have to remember the fact that nobody knew about genetics, right? Um, and so what I think seems obvious to us uh, is, you know, invented by this guy, right? So, you know, hindsight's 2020. So it obviously, it looks really simple now, but in fact, highly unusual. So um, what he was looking at was that, or he believed, right, was that if you, um, you know, had children of something, and this actually kind of harkens back to our height uh, conversation from way back, um, if you have the children of something, they will be likely to carry traits of the parents, okay? And, you know, so if you want to do those kinds of tests, things that grow fast and have children fast are usually a good thing to study, right? Uh, so he actually studied pea plants, like, you know, the things you eat, peas. Um, and uh, if you've never seen a pea plant, they actually have very pretty flowers. Um, but so actually, wait, is that in the former picture? Or is that just peas? Oh, yeah. Um, but um, so the sample set he had, right, either had purple flowers or it had white flowers. Um, 
And each plant starting with 75% chance, regardless of the colors of the other plants. And so that's the theory he was trying to prove. And we're going to talk about some more, um, maybe today, maybe later, um, kind of like, you know, this is, this is the thing we want to know, right? And so we kind of come up with a question that we're trying to solve for. And we have uh, specialized terminology for that that we'll get into. Um, but so this is what he wanted to know is, is the, you know, is this true, right? Um, and so what he did was he created a, you know, a statistic to see what percent are purple flowering. And if that percent is larger or much smaller than 75, then that means the model's probably wrong, right? So if it's kind of, you know, right around 75, then it's probably a good, you know, theory, right? Um, and as it says in this last bullet, you know, the distance from 75 is the key. So, you know, as we were showing in that prior graph, um, oh, big deal. Uh, as, oh, you know what? I should just say this one time. We'll make it angry, less angry. Um, so, wait, where's my stupid thing go? So here's that distance, right? So there's the 26, right? And then the distance on either side. All right, so you sample the percent of purple flower and plants and subtract 75. And if the statistic is large, that is evidence against the model. Um, and so now we're going to talk about it. So, what do we do? Okay, well, so the first thing we set up is um, the kind of the, the actual scenario, right? And so in this particular case, um, he actually had 929 pea plants and 709 of them were purple, okay, or had purple flowers. Um, so we kind of set that up as kind of our environment. Um, and so we know the probability of that. So then what we want to do is start to pull out, oh, I didn't get the same, the same exact there. Um, Usually I make the uh, line completely empty so that I don't do stupid things like that. <clears throat> so. Okay, so again, in this particular uh, proportions, uh, that's where I screwed up, I left it blank again. Um, and like I should write notes myself or leave it completely blank and then I won't make that mistake. All right, what, what are the numbers that should go in there to do this uh, population sampling? And remember, if I figure out the keyboard commands to switch, that'd probably be better. So, so we know this much. So what does that mean we should put in for the population percentages? What's the distribution of the population? Come on, somebody's gotta know. So if it's 75%, what are the two numbers I need in there? Right. I rarely ask trick questions. All right, so we put those two in because we want uh, the distribution of the population to be, you know, three quarters and a quarter um, because we think that the purple flowers are three quarters. Um, and if you look up here, it is right around three quarters, right, of the actual flowers. Um, I can't actually read that number, 7.6, or 70, uh, 
76 percent so close enough um and so we're going to say 75 and 25 um and let me make sure i executed that so i don't break it again um then we can pull we're going to make a function again that is going to calculate the samples based on the number of times we're going to try to do it. And so we get 75 for right. No, 73. Um, but again, right, it's going to jitter around that 75. Um, and so theoretically, if we run it a bunch of times, we'll get, you know, things that are all right around that. Um, obviously, doing it this way is uh, way too much work for me. So instead, I'm going to write a loop that's going to run it for what's that say, ten thousand times, um, collecting all of the sample portions out of there to find out what. Excuse me, to find out um, kind of like all those results that are and where they land. You know, so in our simple testing, right, it looks like they'll be right around seventy-five, but we don't know for sure because we didn't run it anywhere near enough to be able to get a good sense of whether it's good data or not. So we end up with a big array of them. Um, and so we want to look at a histogram version of it. And we see that, right, we do seem to fall kind of mostly in that 75 range. So that probably means it's a pretty good uh, model. Um, and so we can kind of say, hey, when we have, um, you know, when we do all those sample of the proportions, right, what is the model accurate, right? And so in this case, unlike the prior case, this model seems to be pretty close to correct. And then we can actually start to get the distance, right, by subtracting 75, okay? And so the distance away from it, and then we obviously throw an absolute value on it so that we don't get negative numbers because that's not what we care about. What we care about is distance. We don't care which direction that distance is. And as you can see, it's way skewed over here, right? So, you know, we have a, a whole bunch of zero, right? Between zero and one. So this, as you can see here, right? That the distance from the 75, you can see it in the top histogram, but here we can actually get hard numbers for it, right? We can say, what percentage is actually showing, um, you know, how often are we getting close to 75 in terms of like real numbers? Um, and I probably have another typo. Oh, it's because I had to re didn't rerun the notebook. So yeah, so kind of overall, right, we can kind of say, okay, so um, our distance is really not very far away. Does that make sense? Okay, so. All right, so to kind of wrap that up, right? So we kind of have two different scenarios where what we want to do is we want to look at, there's kind of two viewpoints here, right? In, in both scenarios. Um, so we have the model, right? So the number of people on the jury panels were selected randomly from the eligible population. Um, and then the alternative viewpoint, which is they weren't, right? There was some sort of bias issues. And then in the plant example, what we're trying, what we believe to be the case, you know, our hypothesis, in other words, um, is that 75% of the flowers are going to be purple. Um, and the alternative is obviously it won't be. Um, so this is kind of simplistic in the sense that there's only one alternative viewpoint. There may not be only one, but in this case, <clears throat> we have very straightforward questions that we're trying to ask or hypothesis we're trying to prove. So we can say um, there's just kind of the opposite, right? But again, uh, kind of going back to that complement example, um, 
Sometimes it's easier to prove this one than it is to prove this one. But if you really do have just one and one, right? If you prove this, that means this is true. That makes sense? All right, so then we talk about, and so this is kind of like, what did we just do? And kind of formal definition of it, okay? And so what it's referred to is usually assessing a model, okay? And so we usually talk about, you know, this is how we determine the quality of the model is, using assessment. Um, and so what we do is we choose a statistic, right? So something that we are going to calculate um, around the data set that tells us about the discrepancy between the model and the data. Um, then we start to stimulate the statistic <clears throat> uh, under the model's assumptions. So this is where we uh, pull those sample populations and we see what kinds of results we get um, using that statistic. In this case, we were using median. Um, and then we compare the data to the model's predictions. So in other words, we look at, um, you know, or there, there's lots of different ways to do this. The way we're using right now, um, that's <clears throat> probably very common and, and very useful is to, oh my goodness, sorry, uh, draw a histogram of the simulated values of the statistic. and then compute the observed statistic from the real sample. So in other words, like you kind of sample using your model, right? And then you sample with the real data and you kind of compare the two and see how they do. Um, and if the observed statistic is far, right? If the distance is far, then you're probably wrong. So in our first example, right? In the jury selection, um, the, the distance was very far between what our model showed and what you know the supreme court concluded however they came to that conclusion um and i think we are definitely going to be wrapping up a little early today um because i think sorry let me just yeah don't don't, don't post this one. It's got a bunch of slides that are supposed to be there. Um, so, all right, questions? Does that make sense? Um, I just realized that I forgot to delete a bunch of slides. Um, so, I'll sort of kind of back up there. But so, you know, this is kind of the important part, right? It's, this is the process you go through. Um, if you ever took, you know, like a science class and, you know, uh you know lower schools or whatever um they take you through a process of when you're doing a science project or something like that of like you know setting up a hypothesis then kind of going through all these different steps this is the same kind of thing right is that here are the steps you go through and it helps sometimes if you think about the steps you have to go through uh so that you don't skip it right uh and so that's why it's a good thing to have kind of memorized in the back of your head even though you're kind of going to gloss over most of this when you're thinking about it what you want to do is go back and kind of review whatever you did and say, okay, did I, you know, did I, did I follow the steps correctly to make sure that you came to something about, and we're going to talk about more of these um, and, you know, and kind of more completeness around the different steps as we go. All right, questions? Sorry, I asked that already and then I forgot to look around. All right, cool. Uh, that's